Shabbat Shalom everyone, I'm Ryan White of Rooted in Torah Ministries and this is the Torah portion Sab, which is Leviticus 6 verse 8 through 8 verse 36. And this one deals with the uh, how the priests, how the, how the meat from the sacrifice gets divided up among the priests and what they're supposed to do with it, with the blood, with the utensils and stuff that they're used. And then it also goes into the consecration of the priesthood, which is something that we actually covered in Exodus, because it basically has the, essentially the same story. There is a little bit of stuff that is you know different there, obviously, but a lot of the same material. And so we're really not going to go into that. If you want to, you can go back and check out the corresponding Torah portion for that. Uh, what I want to do, though, is focus in on what the the remnants of the sacrifice, what the priests do with that. And we're also going to back up a little bit because we didn't get time to finish up the discussion last week. And we're going to talk about that Asham offering, that guilt offering, because it's also referred to here in this week's Torah portion. So let's begin by blessing our Creator as is our custom. Barku et Adonai Hamvorak, Baruch Adonai Hamvorak Leolam Vaed, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher bachar banu mikol hamim ve'natan lano et toroto baruch atah Adonai noten ha Torah. Amen. Amen. All right, let's jump in here. And again, I'm going to back up a little bit to this asham offering. Uh, this asham offering is the called the guilt offering, but <laughs> as with the the so-called sin offering. This isn't the best answer or the best uh, label for it. In fact, uh, Jacob Milgram, again, who wrote this book, you can check out last week, I talked a little bit about this. He calls it the reparation offering. And I, again, I would agree with him on this when you look at the evidence presented. Because the when you read the description, it's not that the person is feeling guilty. It's more that they are... Uh, experiencing the consequences for doing something wrong. And when we look at the reasons why you bring this, it, it starts to make a little bit of sense. So let's go back to Leviticus chapter 5, and it is, here, let's see, Leviticus 5 verse 1. The law of the guilt offerings. So we see that it says, you know, if a person sins, when he hears a public adjuration to testify when he is a witness, whether he is seen or otherwise known, if he does not tell it, he will bear his guilt. So he, he hears someone testifying improperly and he keeps his mouth shut. Or if he touches an unclean thing and it was hidden from him and he is unclean, then he will be guilty. Uh, which would kind of imply that he touched, he became ritually unclean, and then he went around and, and came in contact with stuff that he should, stuff that you're not supposed to contact when you're holy, or if he touches human uncleanliness, or if a person swears thoughtlessly through his lips to do evil or to do good, in whatever manner the man is speaking thoughtlessly with the oath, when it become, and it is hidden from him, when it becomes known, notice that each of these, it becomes known to him then he will be guilty of it. And when he's guilty of this, he shall confess that which he has sinned. So he's, he needs to confess. It doesn't say he confesses it over the animal, just he needs to confess it. And part of that confession process is bringing the guilt offering. The word there is asham, asham, which is a female from the flock, a, a lammer or a goat for a sin offering, and he makes atonement. And then if he can't afford it, there's some lesser things. So let's talk a little bit about these offerings, okay? So the sin offering, or the purification offering, when it's brought for sins, the sins that you bring it for are not sins that are, are performed because you did it intentionally. Willful, rebellious, intentional sins, there's no sacrifice for. When you, you know, It's like um, when, when King David... Remember when King David, he, he sleeps with Bathsheba and then has her, her husband killed? And what does he say in the psalm? He says, if there was an offering, I would bring it. But there's no offering for that type of, of willful, rebellious sin. 
however, and, and so the, the, the uh, sin offering, it talks about someone basically either not knowing what they did was a sin, being unaware of the commandment, or not realizing what they were doing. I mean, and, and this seems kind of maybe a little bit strange to you, but how many of you have been kind of caught up in the moment, and then afterwards you look back and said, oh, you know, I shouldn't have said that about so-and-so, or I shouldn't have done that, so on and so forth. That is what's called an unintentional sin. Now, there, the, these are kind of concepts that come out of the text. There really is not a word for a, a purely unintentional sin. Any, there is a word for a rebellious sin, though, and that is, uh, I'm bl- sorry, I am now blanking on the word here for the intentional sin. Uh, but there is a Hebrew word that does discuss this, uh, this, un- or this intentional sin, it's willful rebellious sin. There's a third category that's really not actually talked a lot about, but this is where it falls within this guilt offering. It's that you, you did it, you were kind of aware of it, but afterwards you, you recognize what you're doing was wrong. And it's kind of more like a sin of the flesh sort of thing. And so I have a, an example that I like to go through that kind of makes the point, okay? Now, I've got four sons, and we're going to take three of them and, and use this as an example. So my wife makes some awesome chocolate chip cookies, and she puts uh, ground uh, coffee grounds in them. And it just it's, it's delicious, it's incredible, it's wonderful. And so I love these cookies, and they're mine. So... Let's say she just finishes baking them, okay? And I get them and I put them in my non-pagan cookie jar and they're sitting there on the counter. And my first son, he comes along and he sees the cookies in the cookie jar and so he just opens it up, takes one out and eats it. What type of sin did he just commit? He committed an unintentional sin because see, he just saw cookies. He didn't know that those were my cookies and I'm not willing to share my delicious chocolate chip and coffee cookies with him. And so when I confront him, when he realizes what he's done is wrong, he's going to come up to me and say, Dad, Dad, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. Uh, What can I do to make it up to you? I say, you know what? Go offer up a bowl on the altar before me and it'll be all good, okay? (laughs) You, You know, so that is the completely unintentional sin. Now, after this has happened, I sit my two sons, my, my, the rest of my sons, all my sons down, and I say, you know what, guys? These are my cookies. Mom made these for me. These are my favorite. They've got coffee grounds in them, which co- you guys are too young for coffee. I do not want you touching my cookies. You're cut off completely. Okay, Dad. So they go away. My second son, he just, he's staring at him, and he's just looking at me. He's like, oh, man, those are so delicious. They're so good. I just, I, I really want one. So he kind of looks around. No one's looking, okay? And so he grabs a cookie and he runs off behind the chair and he eats the cookie. Now the third son, he comes along and he goes, Dad doesn't own me. He doesn't control me. I know what's best for me. And so he grabs a cookie and he just walks in front of me and just starts eating the cookie. Both of those two sons, those, those, those second and third son, both of those sons committed sin against me. But what was the difference between the two of them? The one who came in front of me and ate, he didn't care about the relationship. He didn't, he didn't care if what he was doing was hurting me. In fact, he was trying to hurt me acting spiteful by eating it in front of me. He was willful, rebellious. It's like that guy who was picking up sticks on the Shabbat. Willful, rebellious sin, doing it intentionally. In the Hebrew, it basically kind of gives the impression he was high-handed. He was saying, you know, I don't care, God. I'm going to do this intentionally because it's the Sabbath. My other son, he also chose to do something wrong because... Unfortunately, that is our nature as humans. Sometimes we, we just feel this pressure and sometimes we, we cave into our sinful nature. We succumb to, to sin as a master. But he knew that it was wrong and he didn't want to hurt me, so he went and hid while he was doing it. He tried to hide what he was doing because he did not want to hurt me. He cared about the relationship. 
which son am I going to forgive? Well, ultimately, I'll end up forgiving both of them. <laughs> and, and our Father does forgive willful, rebellious sins. Even that's, that's what Yeshua came to do, is to, for, to, to provide that way to, to forgive those willful, rebellious sins. But I, it's going to be a lot harder for this, this willful, rebellious son than it is for the one who hid, because he still wants the relationship. And so I'm going to offer him a way to bring an offering to bring a sacrifice. And so this, this asham, this guilt offering, is one of the ways that you could do that. You did something wrong, you hid it, and now this is what you can do. This is one of the functions for this. Now you say, well, wait a minute, it doesn't outright say that in the text. That's not how the Bible works. See, the Torah, and I've talked about this before, the Torah is not trying to give you every single situation. It's going to give you a couple examples. It says you bring this if... For example, if this happens, an example of this happens, and you, you go, okay, I, I get it. It's like you did something that you knew was wrong, and you, you hid it, right? Just like this person here that talks about, it says that he was testifying, right? Whether it was known, and he did not tell, he bears his guilt. You see that here in, in Leviticus 5, verse 1. So it was hidden from the community that he did something wrong. And later on, because he was hiding and now he wants to come out and make amends, now he's able to do that. So he offers this guilt offering. So this is a what's called case law. It's casuistic law, which means there's other scenarios that aren't included that you would bring this offering for. You've got to understand the wisdom, the, the, the core principle behind what, why this offering is brought and therefore you can apply it to these situations, such as my son who goes and eats a, a cookie in hiding, right? Now he's got to bring an asham offering to me, if you will, okay? So that's, that's what this asham offering is for. It's also, it talks about someone being unclean, and why, what's wrong with being unclean and not knowing about it? Well, you might have come in contact with a sanctified object, and so they bring that in order to, uh, to, to, uh, to atone for desecration of a sanctified object. Now that's interesting because the Asham offering is a key component of the Nazarite vow and the purification of the leper. Now the Nazarite is someone who's taken a vow and they have elevated holiness and someone dies. So the, the Nazarite is a holy person for that time being. They are a sanctified object and now they've been defiled. You see that? Same thing. Someone who has leprosy. Leprosy is the most severe type of impurity outside of a corpse, outside of being literally dead yourself. That's why they have to be cut off from the camp. And so one of the key parts of the purification of the leper ritual is the asham offering. It's actually the asham offering that they take the blood and they put it on the altar and then they put it on his, his earlobe and on his thumb and on his toe. Just like the asham offering is used for the high priest in Leviticus chapter 8 to put the blood on them. Because it's pure purging, it's purifying a sanctified object. We as a community are sancta. We are sanctified people. And therefore, when someone was cast out from the community because of leprosy, which is a shadow picture of exile, of death, and now they're being brought back in, you use the Asham offering. Now, that's interesting. I, I may have, uh, we may talk about this more when we get to the part, uh, the, the Torah portion covering uh, Leviticus, the, the, the uh, purification of the leper, but I want to show you something really cool here. Isaiah 53 verse 10, I believe, yeah, Isaiah 53, verse 10. So we all know Isaiah 53, this is the suffering servant who we as believers in Yeshua, we, we see that the suffering servant is, in fact, Yeshua. Now, when we look at this, in a lot of versions, it's going to say something different. So I'm going to pull up here, before I put it on the screen, I want to pull up the one that most people are familiar with, and that is the King Jimmy, the King, good old King James Version. Okay, the King James Version says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, for he hath put him for, to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed 
and prolong his days. Let's look at another translation here. We can go to, oh, see, I wonder what the Tanakh says. Oh, that one actually says it correctly. Let's, let's quickly, before you see that, uh, let's go to the English Standard Version. Oh, actually, a lot of these versions are getting it right now. He makes his soul an offering for guilt. That word there is a sham. So what we've traditionally been taught, making his soul a sin offering or a sin sacrifice. In fact, I, I'm sure, well, I don't have it. But anyways, you get, you get the point. There's a lot of different versions out there. And uh, when we look at a lot of them, they're going to use this sin offering because this is what the King James used. But in reality, the Hebrew word behind that is the Hebrew word asham. He's going to be made an asham offering. Now that's interesting because the asham, the guilt offering, was offered for purification of the leper. Someone who has been, a, been sanctified, was cut off, was exiled from the community, was in a state of death, is now being restored back through the asham offering. And Yeshua is spoken of as being that asham offering. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, so let's, let's move into the text in this week's Torah portion, into Leviticus 6. And we see here that it talks about the priests uh, and what they get to do. It, the, specifically with the, the sin offering and the guilt offering, they get to eat a portion of the meat. Okay? And earlier on when we were looking at the Olah offering, we saw that they actually got part of the hide. And that is their payment for their service was the hide. That's why they get the hide. That's, you know, you offered it up, so you get paid. There, there's a built-in concept in the tabernacle that the people who work for God get paid through their work. It wasn't, the tabernacle was not a charity business. It wasn't just like, hey, bring in a donation. It was, you want to draw near to God? Okay, pay your dues. You bring an offering. You, you, the skin of that offering goes to the priest. Part of the meat of that offering. The same thing with the grain offering. The priest got part of the grain. Now, with the sin offering specifically, it's very interesting because in the next week's Torah portion, we're going to see an argument between Aaron and Moses over the sin offering that Aaron brings for the death of Nadav and Avihu, right? his two sons. And Moses is saying, you guys should have eaten it. And Aaron's saying, no, we shouldn't. No, we shouldn't. And it's interesting when we look at the language being used in that section. I believe it's, it's Leviticus 10. Yeah. Leviticus 10. He talks about, should, he make a, should, should Aaron profit from his son's death? I want to try to find this. I, I do apologize. I had not, here we go, hadn't, hadn't thought I was going to go into this, but we are going to see this. Okay, he doesn't talk about profit, but here he says, um, why, you know, Moses is saying, why did you not eat the sin offering in the holy place? As is commanded a couple, ver you know, a couple chapters earlier in this week's Torah portion. He gave it to you to bear away the guilt of the congregation, to make atonement for them. Behold, since its blood has not been brought into the sanctuary, you should have brought it in to eat. And then Aaron said, Behold, this very day they presented their sin offering or their burnt offering before the Lord. When these things like this happen to me, if I eat the sin offering today, would it have been good in the sight of God? So right there, the, the idea is you're bringing your own sin offering. You don't get to eat of it. You don't get to, to enjoy it, to profit off of it. It's a, a penance. It's do, you did something wrong. You're bringing something. and. It's interesting because when an Israelite brings a sacrifice because they did something wrong, sure, some of it goes to the Lord. It does get burnt on the, the altar to the Lord. But also some of this, that sacrifice went to the priest who, brought, who, who officiated for that atonement ceremony. Do you see what, what's going on here? The idea was, was that if you wanted atonement, you had to also, the priest who's enacting that for you, also should get some of the rewards. Otherwise, it's not acceptable. So this brings up an interesting point. If the priests don't eat that offering, they don't eat the meat of that offering, the sin 
or the, the, the entire, the atonement that is received from bringing that offering is not valid, right? This is what he says here. He gave it to you to bear away the guilt of the congregation to make atonement before them, for them before the Lord. So part of that atonement process is the eating of the flesh of that animal. If the priest doesn't eat it, the atonement isn't affected. So it's more than just an, you know, a lot of times people try to, to say, oh, well, God, you know, in order for atonement, something has to die. You're missing the point. First off, you could bring a grain offering. Nothing died when you bring a grain offering, and you could still receive atonement. So that's chink number one in the armor. Chink number two, if you brought your animal in there and you slaughtered it, but you didn't wipe the horn, the blood on the horns of the altar, there's no atonement. If you didn't burn part of the flesh on the, the altar, there is no atonement. If the priest who's officiating it does not eat the meat of the sacrifice, there's no atonement. See, atonement isn't brought about through the death of the animal. In fact, the death of the animal really isn't even discussed. It just says, you shall slaughter it and then collect the blood. The slaughtering is just in order to get the blood. So you can do special stuff with the blood and do special stuff with the meat. So it's the whole process that brings about that atonement. Okay, are we on board there? Now, what's significant about the priest eating of this meat? Can I propose to you something kind of interesting here? The priests, were they allowed to be landowners? Were they given an inheritance? No, they were not. They were not, you know, they are allowed to have like, you know, houses and stuff like that, but they weren't given a huge chunk of land as an inheritance like the rest of the, the, the tribes of Israel. Instead, their portion is the Lord's and they receive a tithe. And the, the idea of the tithe is what? Is that God blessed you and therefore you were to give back to him 10% of that bounty. But when you give when you're giving it to the Lord, what do you how do you give it to the Lord? You give it to the people who are working for the Lord. Now, these priests if no one brought no one paid their tithes, where are they going to get their money from? They don't. They don't have jobs. They don't have businesses. They are completely dependent on Israel's faithfulness to the tithing commandment. And beyond that, they're also dependent, you know, so that's, that's part of their income, but they're also dependent on people actually doing the right thing and bringing sacrifices. So what God does there, because it's interesting, God brings them in the land, and they're all supposed to be blessed and bountiful. And so if everyone's blessed, how do you help out the poor? There shouldn't be any poor, right? If everyone has land and everyone's prospering, there are no poor. And so God creates a class of people, the Levites and the priests, were a class of people who were permanently poor. Now, they may actually have a lot of money, but they had no way to generate income because they didn't, were not allowed to own farming land and vineyards and, and, and stuff like that. Now, you get to the first century and they, the, the priesthood had become very wealthy because they were corrupt and they, they misused the authority God gave them, yes. but God initially created them to be dependent on the people's faithfulness to God. And so that's a very key concept here because as part of this atonement process, as part of this forgiveness process, they were giving meat to a priest who is poor. So part of the forgiveness process is helping out someone who is poor and needy. I hope that makes sense to you if you're able to connect that in your mind that the priests did not have a way of generating income. And so they were like a class of poor. It's that, that picture of helping out the poor and needy. Now, why is that significant? Because when you look at the first century believers, they had received everything from Yeshua. They received the end of the exile, the forgiveness of sins. They're joyful, they're, they're jubilant. And what do they do? They're just giving their money, helping out the poor. Why was it so significant for them to help out the poor? Sure, it advances God's kingdom, but can I propose to you that it's possible 
that because their sins were forgiven, they are now indebted to God, and so they are showing their gratitude by helping out those in need, much like the, the people bringing offerings are giving part of the animal to the Lord's priesthood as a symbol of gratitude, of helping out those who are in need, those who are dependent. The poor, the poor are, are like the priests. They are dependent on the Lord. By the way, part of the tithes were supposed to go to the poor, just like part of the tithes were supposed to go to the priests. You see how, how we're, we're making these connections here. The Levites are similar to the, to the poor because both are supposed to receive part of the tithes. And so can I propose to you that one of the, the lessons that we're, we're being taught here, one of the concepts that is brought out of the sacrificial system, we don't have an, offer, an altar anymore. We don't have a, a temple, a priesthood, but we can take the principles and apply them. So if your sins have been forgiven and you are grateful to your creator, and you want to bring that offering of, of praise, of thanksgiving, of, of penance for the things you've done, can I propose to you part of that process is maybe helping out someone who doesn't, hasn't been as blessed as you. Maybe helping out someone who's poor, or maybe helping out your local pastor. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, these people who bring God's word to you, they need to be provided for as well, because if they are to do what God's calling them to do, can you imagine if the priests had to officiate during the day and at nighttime they had to go to a separate job? Can you imagine how difficult that would be for them? And so God creates this system, this beautiful economic system. And the issue is, a lot of times, is that people nowadays, because there's been the, we, you know, we had the abuses going on, especially in the first century, the, the high priesthood, the aristocracy, they were very much abusing this. And there's been a lot of abuses in the church system as well. A lot of these, uh, you know, some of these mega preachers who are like worth billions of dollars or something, or, you know, millions and millions upon millions. And so, of course, there are abuses but that doesn't mean the system of providing for those people is not something that was God-ordained and God-established. But sometimes when there's abuses, sometimes there's reaction against that. But we've always got to be careful to say, okay, I need to be a good steward and realize I see these people abusing the system, and so I'm not going to be you know, putting my money into that system. I'm going to find somewhere where the system is working properly and give my tithes, my donut, you know, my, my, not tithes, because tithes go to the temple, but our um, best estimation of what a tithe should be, and so on and so forth, to help out and follow that same pattern, because God's giving this, not because he's a cruel overlord, or because he's a greedy, greedy God, it's because this is how the system works in order to advance the kingdom. Amen? I pray that you got a blessing out of this. We're going to finish up with the blessing or the Torah portion. And it reads in Hebrew, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam, asher natan lano torat emet v'achei olam nata betokeinu. Baruch atah Adonai noten ha-Torah. May Yah bless you and keep you. I hope you enjoyed it. Shalom, everyone. Shalom, everyone.